Hi everybody, I hope that you're all doing well. So today I am back to do an interesting video because I've had a bit of a harebrained scheme. So it's been a couple of weeks since Hamilton came out on Disney+. Plus. Let me know if you've watched it. I have really, really enjoyed watching it. As we know, I love Hamilton. I don't know if I've mentioned it, but I did my dissertation partially on Hamilton, don't you know? And I wanted to do a video where I combined my love of Hamilton with my other love, my love of books. And like I say, the other day, a bit of a harebrained scheme took root in my mind to do a book recommendation video where I try to recommend a book for every single song in Hamilton. And within about five minutes, I'd come up with recommendations for at least 10 of the songs and I just could not let that idea go. And I wanted to do these book recommendations entirely from the books that you see behind me, from books that I've read, which just immediately pose a little bit of a challenge. It poses a challenge because you think about the plot of Hamilton and then I think about the books that I have read. And to be honest with you, I do not read many books which deal with war or with battles. And I also don't read that many books that deal very heavily with politics and with government. Like I definitely read books that have that as a bit of a theme or an undertone, but I don't read anything that is explicitly like within government where people are making legislation in the way that they are in Hamilton. However, I think that challenge and the fact that I have to be a little bit more creative with my recommendations is all part of the fun. So the books that I recommend here are not going to be perfect, perfect recommendations. They are not going to be perfect book transfers from each song. I might make a recommendation that is based from a theme or a motif within the song. It might even be just one line within the song that really sticks in my head and that I can think of a book that links to that line. To be honest with you, some of the links I'm going to make to these books and to these songs are going to be a little bit tenuous. You know, there are going to be a few mental leaps that you're going to have to make to accept some of these recommendations, but I think that is all just part of the fun. Now, there are a lot of songs in Hamilton. I believe there are 47 songs in Hamilton, so that's going to lead to quite a long video, especially if I'm giving synopses for both the plot of each of the books and also for the songs. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to split this video up into two parts, one part for Act 1 and then one part for Act 2. And also it's worth bearing in mind that there are going to be spoilers for Hamilton. I always feel a little bit weird in saying, oh spoiler alert for this historic thing that actually happened, but I know, you know, if you don't want to be spoiled for the plot of Hamilton, I am going to be giving synopses for each of the songs, which will include spoilers. So that's your warning now. So of course the very first song in Hamilton is Alexander Hamilton in which the ensemble give us a little bit of a biography of the first 19 years of Alexander Hamilton's life. We learn how he was born in St Croix and how his father left the family and his mother died when he was very young which left him to fend for himself. However when a hurricane comes to St Croix he takes the opportunity to write about this and it gets published in the newspapers and the residents of St Croix read this and recognise the potential in this very very astute intelligent young man and they raise funds to send him off the island to the mainland of the USA to get his education. So here you have the story of a young penniless boy suddenly having his situation and his expectations raised by an act of kindness, which of course leads me to recommend Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, where once again we have the coming of age story of Pip, who after a mysterious benefactor comes into his life and funds his education, he is able to go to London to better himself and raises his expectations. In the same way that Alexander Hamilton's life was changed by a financial contribution, an act of kindness, we have the same thing happen to Pip in Great Expectations. The second song in Hamilton is Aaron Burr, so in which Alexander Hamilton is introduced to the man who will, at least in the musical, become his long-standing rival Aaron Burr. Through the song he's also introduced to three men who will become his real friends and companions in the first act of the musical. He meets John Lawrence, Hercules Mulligan and the Marquis de Lafayette. What really sticks out to me in this song is that this is the introduction to a long-running theme within Hamilton, which is the difference of personality between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. These are two men who are so similar in so many different ways. They are both very ambitious, very intelligent men. They both become lawyers. They both work to better themselves after having unfortunate backstories. They both were orphans. However, their lives go down very, very different paths. And the thesis of the musical is really that this is due to their differing personalities. Aaron Burr, on one hand, is very ambitious, but he's also very strong on self-preservation. His main 
theme and main motif is wait for it. Do not just barrel in without thinking. Wait to see how the tide is turning and then make your move. Whereas Alexander Hamilton is the complete antithesis to that. He is very much barrel into things without thinking. He's very much like, these are my opinions and everybody must know about them now. So for this book recommendation, I really did want to focus in on this idea of two people who come from very similar backgrounds, but who go down different paths and the consequences of that. So for that, I have Homegoing by Yog Yassi. Homegoing tells the story of two half sisters, one of whom ends up marrying a slave trader, the other who gets enslaved and basically goes down the different generations and sees the consequences of these this difference in their life and what this did to their descendants. Really highlighting how they came from very, very similar backgrounds. I can't remember if it's their mother or their father that they share, but one change in their life irrevocably alters their descendants' lives. Which, like I say, is the main theme of Hamilton. Like, this one little difference in personality is what really changes Aaron Burr and Hamilton's futures. The next song is My Shot, in which Alexander Hamilton basically dazzles everybody by his wit and his intelligence. And really him setting up his thesis of how he wants to join the revolution and fight for an independent America and what that means to him. There's so many different themes and topics that come up in My Shot. Uh, which recur later on in the musical. But something that I really wanted to pick up on with my book recommendation was having this, sitting back and having this feeling of awe when you're watching the song, which you really do feel when you are watching uh, Le Mamo Miranda perform my shot. And I was thinking, when else have I had that feeling of awe when reading, when I've been watching a character at work and just thinking, how, how does he manage to do that? And it was definitely, for me, A Study in Scarlet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is the first chronological story, of course, in the Sherlock Holmes series, and is Dr. Watson meeting Sherlock Holmes and, once again, becoming absolutely enthralled and in awe of this man and how he works out his mysteries. Because the Sherlock Holmes mysteries were never written with the intention that a reader was going to be able to solve them. The whole premise and the whole fun of Sherlock Holmes is you just sitting back and watching Sherlock Holmes at work and seeing how his mind just whirls. Which is definitely the feeling that I get when I listen to my short, just thinking, wow, this guy's smart. <laughs> The fourth song in Hamilton is The Story of Tonight, in which Alexander Hamilton, John Lawrence, uh, Hercules Mulligan, and the Marquis de Lafayette are all sat having their last round of drinks and talking about the upcoming revolution and how they are going to join the fight. You really hear their conviction that they are going to fight for whatever they believe in, no matter what the consequences is, because they believe in this revolution. And I have to say, I, I heard this song and I immediately thought of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. I think it is kind of typical to think rebellion, young, students trying to incite a revolution and to think of Les Mis. But I couldn't get out of my head the scenes in which like Angelas and Marius and Grantaire are all talking about their upcoming rebellion that they are trying to fight. Just the belief that these young boys have in what they are trying to do and their absolute conviction that it's going to work this time, that they are going to stand strong and fight for what they believe in. And it does also remind me very much of the musical, of course, and the song Drink With Me and Do You Hear The People Sing. And yes, maybe it is quite a chunky book just to get to that section of it, but I, I do think it's well worth it, and I, I would recommend reading Glamis anyway. <laughs> The next song is The Schuyler Sisters, in which we are introduced to Angelica, Eliza, and Peggy Schuyler, who will become very, very much crossed in Hamilton's story. It's not a very plot-heavy song, we're just being introduced to these three women, really mainly introduced to Angelica and Eliza, who will play the most prominent role in Hamilton's life. And the main thing that I thought of when I was thinking about this song was this sisterly dynamic. And so, of course, you think about sisters in books, you think about Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I actually didn't read this until the end of last year when the film was coming out. I desperately wanted to read it before I saw the film and I loved this story. I think it really does link back into the Skylar Sisters with this very loving sisterly dynamic, but also the ways in which that dynamic changes as we get older. You really get that in Good Wives as, as you become more independent from your family and as you start to settle down, maybe get married, have children, get a job, how that dynamic can really change as you try to become a more independent person. But that, that sisterly love is still there and I think that's definitely true when you think about the Skyler sisters in the musical. The sisters go their separate ways but their love and their bond is still so strong. Now I want to put that question to to you, who do you think corresponds to which sister uh, from the Skyler Sisters to Little Women? I think you could definitely make an argument for Angelica being like Jo, and then maybe Eliza being like a bit of a combination of Meg and Beth. I don't think we know much about Peggy to say which of the sisters she is, but she is the baby of the family, so I guess Amy is the uh, analogy for her. 
Song number six is Farmer Refuted, which I think is actually quite an underrated song in Hamilton. I really, really love it. If nothing else but for the line, don't modulate the key, then not debate with me. This is basically the song equivalent of a bit of a pamphlet battle that went on between Samuel Seabury and Alexander Hamilton on the topic of the Continental Congress. This is a really, really fun song because it starts off with Samuel Seabury singing uh, his song about how you shouldn't respect this rebellion and do not believe the word of revolution. And then Alexander Hamilton pops up and basically tears apart his argument. But he does so by calling back to the individual words of Samuel Seabury's verse. I can't really explain it and do it justice, but you definitely have to give it a listen to understand what I mean. And this is where I did cheat a little bit and I've included a book that I haven't actually read. I've seen this book in shops and I flicked through it many times, but I just could not think of another book that fit this song better. I also have to give a big thank you to Jessica from Jessica's Reading Ruminations because I was absolutely killing myself uh, trying to think of what this book was because I, like I say, I'd seen it in shops before, but I could not for the life of me think of it and she reminded me, so thank you. <laughs> but it is Answering Back, which is a poetry collection which is edited by Carol Ann Duffy in which you have a classic poem and then a modern poet does their own take, their own interpretation of that poem. And I thought that worked so, so well with Farmer Refuted, this idea of having an original song and then kind of riffing on it, which is exactly what Alexander Hamilton does through the song Farmer Refuted. And now that I'm thinking about this poetry collection, I think I might have to pick it up at some point because oh, the premise is just great to me. The next song is You'll Be Back, which I know is an absolute favourite for so many different Hamilton fans. In this song, we see King George III appear and he basically directs his song to the American colonies, saying that he rejects their independence, that he is going to fight to get America back. And it's very much played as if King George III is like a bitter ex-boyfriend who is saying, you'll be back, you'll come crawling back to me. And so with that in mind, I thought of The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary. In this book, we have the main character Tiffy, who after having a really, really bad breakup from her ex-boyfriend, ends up uh, accepting quite a dodgy sounding flat share. <laughs> I mean, yes, it is a rom-com and yes, it all works fine because it's fiction, uh, but yeah still still a bit of a dodgy situation. She ends up accepting this flat share situation in which she and the other occupant of the flat share a bed, only he works night shifts and she works regular nine to five, so they never end up meeting. But Tiffy's ex-boyfriend still plays a recurring role within this story, and a major theme of this is gaslighting, of him saying, you, you need me, you will come crawling back to me. So yes, this definitely came to mind when I thought of you'll be back, because the ex-boyfriend in this is horrible. Definitely King George III material. The next song is Right Hand Man. This is the song where we first meet George Washington within the narrative of Hamilton. The war for independence is not going well at all and George Washington realises that he's going to need a right hand man. In comes Hamilton. And I thought to myself, hmm, the relationship between a very powerful figure and his right hand man had to go for Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, which tells the story of Thomas Cromwell, who ended up being Henry VIII's right-hand man. Until he got executed. Shh. But in many ways, you can see the links between Thomas Cromwell and Alexander Hamilton. They got to their place by being these very intelligent, learned men who are not afraid to speak to power. So I think there are a lot of parallels that you can draw between Wolf Hall and Hamilton. The next song is one of the slightly shorter, kind of transitional songs in Hamilton. It's called A Winter's Ball, in which we get introduced to the idea of Hamilton having to marry, and particularly having to marry for wealth. This is the scene in which he is introduced to both Angelica and Eliza Schuyler through a winter's ball. And I thought to myself, going to a ball to check out the marriage prospects, I mean, there are quite a few classics in which this fits, and I was very, very tempted to use Northanger Abbey for this, but I think we have to go for the classic Pride and Prejudice, because I think especially the idea of marrying well plays such a prominent theme in Pride and Prejudice that this really had to be the book that I gave this to. In this, of course, we've got the classic Jane Austen story of the five Bennet sisters and how their lives are changed when two wealthy gentlemen enter in their town. Of course, when I'm thinking about the Winter's Ball, you know, you've got the dance at Meryton, but you've also got the atrocious <laughs> Neverfield Ball, which is very, very glamorous, but where so many things go wrong. <laughs> the next song is Helpless, which is sung by my personal favourite character in Hamilton, Eliza, and it details her courtship with Alexander Hamilton and how they come to marry. It's such a gorgeous, fun, upbeat song, and Philippa Sue is just 
beautiful, amazing, stunning, her voice is incredible. And I immediately thought of Evelina by Frances Burney. And I think for many, many reasons this is quite a good fit for this song. Not only was it written very, very close to when Alexander Hamilton and Eliza did get married, I believe this was published in 1778 and they got married in 1780, but you've also got this theme of this young woman's entrance into society, falling in love and eventually getting married, sorry, spoiler. <laughs> but I mean, that was how most of these stories ended anyway. But also, uh, this is an epistolary novel. I so said that wrong. I can never say that word right. Uh, but it's told in letters. And of course, Eliza and Alexander's uh, courtship was all done primarily through letters. And those letters become a major theme later on in the story, especially in the song Burn. So I think between that aspect and also the love story, uh, this was definitely the right pick. And then following on from Helpless, we've got Satisfied, which is basically the same story, but told from the perspective of Angelica. We go back in time and we see Eliza's sister, Angelica's perspective on the courtship between Eliza and Alexander. And we see her admitting that she is also in love with Hamilton. And we see her coming to regret her choice to not pursue Alexander Hamilton when she realised that he was penniless because she knows that she has to marry rich in order to survive in the cruel, cruel world that is the 18th century. So I thought through this song we've got kind of a bit of a time travel aspect. She's going back and reflecting on her past. She's also having a lot of regrets about something that she did in terms of love. And the book that really sprung to mind for me with that premise was Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. This book features a a coffee house in which the patrons can pay to go back in time, but there are some restrictions to this time travel. You can only time travel within the setting of the coffee shop and you have to come back to the present before the coffee gets cold. And through this we have multiple stories in which people have used this time travel aspect in order to go backwards and forwards to confront people that they love. Even though they are very very restricted to the changes that they can make, it just means that they go back to their present feeling a lot better about how their relationship relationships pan out. I feel like if Angelica had had the opportunity to time travel and go back to Hamilton and tell how she feels in the way that they do in this book, she definitely would have taken it. And yeah, this was the first book that really popped to mind for me. The next song is The Story of Tonight Reprise, in which we've basically got Hamilton, John Lawrence, the Marquis de Lafayette, and Hercules Mulligan, who are all drunkenly celebrating Alexander Hamilton's wedding to Eliza. We also, in this song, find out about Aaron Burr's affair with the married Theodosia. I think that the thing that really spoke to me about this song was just how drunk all of them are, especially John Lawrence, who is slurring his words throughout the entire song. So the book that came to mind for me was The Short History of Drunkenness, How, Why, Where, and when humankind has got merry from the stone age to the present, which is by Mark Forsyth. This is just such a fun book, which as, it, as the title suggests, is all about drunkenness through history. The rituals of drink and our relationships to alcohol. It's such a fun concept for a book. It's really accessible, popular history, and one that I would recommend to every incoming student. The next song is Wait For It, which is a solo by Aaron Burr, in which we really get a glimpse into his mindset and his attitude to life. How frustrated he is by Hamilton, but also how in awe he is of Hamilton and the way that Hamilton does barrel into things without thinking and it seems to be paying off for him. Whereas Burr's attitude is very much to wait for it, to kind of stand on the sidelines and see how things are going before he makes his move. But really what I think you get from this song is despite how insistent Aaron Burr is that he isn't being stagnant and that he is just lying in wait to make his move, what you really get from Hamilton is that he's just inactive through a lot of the story. He thinks that he is being sensible, but really he's holding himself back. So actually I focused in on a character who is similarly very inactive throughout their story. So I went for My Sister the Serial Killer by Ian Kim Braithwaite. This tells a story between two sisters. It is told by the perspective of Caridi, who is often called upon by her sister after she seems to be killing a lot of her boyfriends. And how Caridi's attitude to Iola really starts to shift and her attitude to these murders and covering it up once Ayula starts making eyes at a doctor that Karidi has been in love with for many years. But in many ways, similar to Aaron Burr, Karidi is very inactive as a character. There is a lot going on inside her head, but she is not making decisions. She is a very passive character. And really the devastating impacts of her inactivity is that Ayula is allowed to get away with murder, literally. 
like Bert, she doesn't make a stand when she can because in many ways she's just too scared and also her family loyalty is so, so strong. I feel like I can see a lot of parallels in her own activity and in Aaron Burr's own activity throughout Hamilton. The next song in Hamilton is Stay Alive in which Alexander Hamilton is kind of narrating what is going on in the war effort so far and it's not going well. We're introduced to Alexander Hamilton's frustration with how George Washington is not allowing him to take control of a battalion and really how dire the situation is and what really sprung to mind for me is this this idea of brushes with death. If you've seen the pro shot probably what sticks into your mind is the moment where one of the ensemble members who plays the bullet um, just goes right past Hamilton and a bullet very narrowly misses his head. So with this theme of brushes with death I've got I Am I Am I Am by Maggie O'Farrell. This is a memoir in which Maggie O'Farrell recounts the 17 brushes with death that she has had. Whether that be medical mishaps, accidents or even murder situations that she narrowly avoided. Some of these near deaths are kind of tenuous but you can kind of see how she got there and it's a really interesting look at how close we all are to death. You just do not know what day is going to be your last. Which is definitely the feeling that I think a lot of the army were feeling at this point because if they hadn't won the American Revolutionary War all of these people, all of these rebels would have been killed. No question about it. The next song is The Ten Jewel Commandments in which we as the audience are introduced to this concept of the jewel which comes up frequently throughout Hamilton. We see Hamilton's friend John Lawrence preparing to duel against Charles Lee and these ten rules that have been devised for good jewel etiquette. And I was trying really desperately to think of a book that I had read that deals with the concept of a jewel and I just couldn't think of something. I don't tend to read things where people fight, just everyone just get on please, thank you. I did eventually come back to an old faithful which is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I have mentioned this many 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 times but this does include a little bit of a jewel fight scene. Though how much you could say that this is a jewel uh, is questionable but it is one-on-one -on -one fighting. Like I say I'm not going to bore you with my synopsis of Sir Gawain because I've talked about it many many times uh, but yes. This is, this is my pick for this song. The next song is Meet Me Inside, which is a confrontation between George Washington and Hamilton in which they both kind of get out their frustration against each other. I think they really play up this dynamic between George Washington and Hamilton as being very much like a father-son relationship. So I wanted to pick upon a, a book which really focuses on child-parent relationships and particularly parent-child conflict. Uh, so for that I have A Place for Us by Fatima Fahim Mirza. The main narrative of this story is uh, a son within this family who is estranged because of arguments and falling out. And also uh, this takes place, the very first scene of this takes place on the 4th of July, which I think is quite fitting for this musical. The next song is another Eliza one, so of course I love it, and it is That Would Be Enough, which is such a beautiful song. In this song we see Hamilton after he's been sent back home and he discovers that his wife Eliza is pregnant He's so frustrated with the fact that he's been sent home and that he doesn't seem to be getting anywhere in his quest to, you know, rise to the top. Meanwhile, Eliza is saying that she doesn't mind how much money he makes. She doesn't mind if he's this big prominent man. She just wants to be a family. And so for this book prompt, I really wanted to pick a book that really focuses on uh, the wives of these great men. And the book that I came up with for this was Love Letters of the Great War. As this title suggests for this book, you've got the letter interactions between these men who went off to fight, but also you get some insight into the women who wrote back to them. History is focused so much on the men who went off to fight without thinking about the fact that, you know, women were affected by this too. And I think this collection really tries to rebalance that and see that it's not just the men who are losing something with this battle. You know, you've got the home front who are also working hard and who have just as much to lose from this confrontation. And really this idea of what are you fighting for? You're fighting so that you're able to go back to your loved ones and to have a better world to live in with them. The next song is Guns and Ships, which is such a fun song and has a really, really fast rap bit, which I always try and do and fail at. And no, I'm not gonna do it for you right now. <laughs> In this song, we have George Washington realizing that he needs to call back Alexander Hamilton and that the last big push at Yorktown is coming up. We also have Lafayette doing his very, very fast rap about how France has come back with guns and ships for their use. And once again, I was in a bit of a conundrum where I was like, I don't read many books that are about battles. What can I have for this? Um, so I was kind of scouring my shelves for something that could possibly fit for this. I do not tend to deal with battle strategy at all in the books that I read. Uh, so the one that I came across was Clash of Kings by George R. R. Martin and I was thinking particularly about the Battle of Blackwater, which is the real set piece, real climax of this book, is the battle between Stannis Baratheon and King's Landing. Thinking about how Tyrion Lannister as Hand of the King has to kind of get all the supplies ready in order to fight this siege that he knows is coming. So that is my pick for that. Like I say, 
battles, not my thing. <laughs> The next song is History Has Its Eyes On You, which is sung by George Washington, in which he welcomes back Alexander Hamilton, but reminds him how important this battle is, and warns him of his negative experience of having had history having its eyes on him from a very, very young age, and really pushes the central theme of Hamilton, which is that you do not have any control over how history remembers you, you do not have any control of who lives, who dies, who tells your story. So really it could be any history book that I would recommend for this as a history student, you know, I've had to read many a history book in my time, so I'm just going to go for the standard studying history, Palgrave. Uh, this, this this, is just a history student standby. <laughs> and you know, if you do want to look into historiography and how we record history, then th th this is the book for you. The next song is Yorktown, and this is the final big battle, the one that pushes things over the edge in which the colonies win the fight for independence. Which means I had to find another war book! Yay! Ugh. Oh, it's just really not my thing. And yeah, my recommendation for this is The Return of the King, the final book in the Lord of the Rings series. Yay, fighting, big push, defeat the baddie, woo. Fine, yeah, fine. Song 21 in Hamilton is What Comes Next. This is another King George song in which he is lamenting the fact that he is lost and he's just absolutely baffled by this. And he's setting a question to the independent colony saying, what comes next? Do you understand how hard it is to be a leader? You're off on your own. Do you know what you're doing? I don't think you do. And it's another big theme in Hamilton. I think of the big reason why we don't just end the story here, we keep going on to seeing how the country sets itself up, is the idea that winning and fighting is easy, but governing is much, much harder. And the idea that trying to stick to these ideal principles that you fought a revolution with is really, really hard to maintain. So I wanted a book that reflected this idea. So with that, I have Animal Farm by George Orwell. Yay! Because of course, in this, you have the farm animals who stage a revolution with these very idealistic utopian concepts. But when it actually comes to practicing uh, those ideals, it's really, really hard and it easily gets manipulated. It's so easy for somebody to swoop in and take control and change all of these ideals because winning is easy, governing is harder. The next song is Dear Theodosia, in which Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton are basically just having this little love letter to their children who have been born just after the revolution. And I really wanted to find a book that talks about parenting and wanting to make the world better for your descendants, for your children. Uh, and the book that I came onto was Dear Ejio Wele, A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. In this book, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is talking about how a friend came up to her who has recently had a daughter and she's wanting to know how to raise her daughter to be feminist. And these are basically the 15 suggestions that she gives her. And I think this really does speak to this idea of wanting to lay a strong foundation for your children so that they can grow up into a world that is better than the one that you've grown up in. Obviously, the world that Ejio Wele is going to be growing up into is very different to the world that Philip and Theodosia grew up into 200, 300 years ago, but we're constantly trying and struggling to make world, the world better for our children and for our descendants, so I think this is a really lovely uh, analogy for that. The next song in Hamilton is actually the only song that doesn't appear in the cast recording. You would only see it if you see it live, and that is Tomorrow There'll Be More Of Us, which is such a sad song. This is why they didn't include it, because I just cry every time I listen to it. This is the song in which Alexander Hamilton finds out that unfortunately his best friend John Lawrence has been killed days after the revolution ended. And so for this song, my book recommendation is going to be The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, because of course I have to push The Song of Achilles into every video that I do. And I'm actually not going to do too much to justify this pick, but what I will just say, like, if you know uh, some of the historical rumours surrounding John Lawrence and Hamilton, and if you know the plot of Song of Achilles and the rumoured relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, you'll understand uh, why this is a good pick, and you'll probably understand and pick up upon what scene I am referring to with in this book that fits in very very well with this song. And then the final song of Act 1, this is going to be such a long long video, is Nonstop, which I have to say this is one of my favourite songs in Hamilton, it's probably top five and I don't think it's appreciated enough. This basically recounts the next few years of Alexander Hamilton's life as he keeps on rising and he works as a lawyer, he writes the Federalist Papers and then he does eventually become the Treasury Secretary for 
George Washington's government. Once again, it's mainly narrated by Aaron Burr and he is just in awe of how Alexander Hamilton just keeps on writing, keeps on doing just so much as if he is running out of time. As he says repeatedly, this man seems to be non-stop. So I thought, you know, what can I pick for this song? Where can I think about somebody who just does a lot of work? And I'm a big fan of a productivity book. So I thought, what might Alexander Hamilton read uh, to make sure that he keeps on creating and that he's working nonstop? He might pick up How to Be a Productivity Ninja by Graham Alcott. Just how to get your life in order, get your shit together, be a bit more productive. And I really like it for that reason. And I think if Alexander Hamilton were here today, he'd probably have picked this up by now. So those were all of the songs and all of the book recommendations that I'm going to give for act one of Hamilton. It's been so, so fun to think about the book recommendations that I would do for each of the songs in Hamilton. Like I say, I love reading and I love Hamilton. So I had to combine uh, my loves in some sort of way. So I will be back to do act two at some point. Do let me know what book recommendations you would have for each of these songs. Because like I say, this is very, very subjective to the books that I have read, which do not always mesh perfectly well uh, with the songs in Hamilton. So please let me know what you would put for each of these songs. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed the recommendations and I hope you are having a fantastic day and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thanks! Bye!